Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to Kaiserreich. I'm your host, Mr. Destroying Guangzhou Government Lover. But, um, we gotta talk about the Juntong on the march as well as a brazen attempt. <clears throat> and shocking, but in some expected ways, news today, President Wang Jingwei was almost killed in a vicious assassination attempt by a disgruntled revolutionary. While the media was taking pictures following a speech by Wang outside of the presidential palace, a gunman shouted down, a shouted down with the traitors opened fire and barely missed killing Wang. The assassin was apprehended, and Wang, who ironically began his revolutionary career as a failed assassin, was carried to a hospital to treat minor wounds to his cheek and arm. The greater damage, however, was immediate follow as images of the attempted attempt circulated. Although most published statements condemning the attack and wishing the tribune a speedy recovery, plain noted that this is the only the latest report of violence against politicians for insiders. The culprit is an open secret. Even as the police interrogate the perpetrator, radical officers within the NRA affiliated with the CRS have often acted with a reckless abandon, a testament of the KMT's inability to handle the rising radicalism within their government. Too busy fighting among themselves to give stable leadership, worryingly. Many individuals outside of and even opposed to the CRS have responded with indifference or even approval of the act. This attack, however, is one step too far. So it must be held accountable. The only question is how deeply to look. We must get to the bottom of this. Nice. Lose stability. I fear what we, might, we, what we might find below the surface. Who needed political power in the Juntong on the march? We, with funding for their plans to secure, the League of Ten have sprung into action in building their new Juntong, or National Bureau of Intelli Investigation and Statistics. Originating from a mixture of uh, Dai Chongfeng's shady connections with the Shanghai Nationalist Underground and the existing military intelligence apparatus, this new agency is gearing up for the offensive action, infiltrating destabilizing rival factions in China. Dai has posed three priorities for his agents to guide them over for the years to come. One, ensure the league's safety, or leader's safety. Although they are now officially independent of Hu Zongnan's personal staff, it's clear that Dai remains a major asset for the general's clique of extremist officers. It is no secret that they view Wang as an unworthy leader and want him replaced. Two, punish corruption. The league was known to have a spark, fraternal work environment, mixing Confucianism and revolutionary nationalism to become what they say as a modern knight errant. Ironically, Dai is self-conscious about his lack of military direct, direct military experience compared to his Wompa classmates. The Jin Tong are adamant about eliminating internal corruption and xenophobically view both the RF and CSP as foreign lackeys. Destre 3. Destroy all counter revolutionary forces. The Jin Tong are utterly devoted to the nationalistic cause and are throwing themselves into the task at hand. Cells are being established across the nation, agents embedding themselves across society. Clergymen, politicians, and press have been swayed, bribed, or coerced into service, and dies have begun making ties with movie stars, playboys, and opera performers. Even plenty of Chinese overseas have been recruited to the growing intelligence agency. Huh. A true leader's safety is paramount. Treason in the party will be excised. Wang's, Wang Fakin will be assassinated for his treachery. We hasten the fall of the reactionary. We can punish corruption. Get Go really radical here, shall we? But, like we saw last time, we're actually uh, trying to beat up the, the government here. We're doing alright. We have 94% for revolutionary radicalism. Um, they actually have three quality divisions here. With our normally not great infantry, but, you know, is this a hill? No, this is a mountain, so we have a bonus in fighting in mountains for these guys, so, yeah, overall not too bad, and we made another encirclement here, another three divisions encircled, smash them to bits, please, just keep smashing them, and when, you're, when I'm done with you, I'm going to keep smashing you, can I say that? Yes, I can, anyways, you know, I gotta go right here, anyways, oh, get down there, into our artillery, finally, 1938, happy new year, everybody, it's only February, and almost March, I only forgot your new year, sorry, um, casualties, though, They've lost 37,000. The fall of Washington. Very good. Very, 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 very good. Um, 38. Uh, I'll grab this one. Uh, we could save up our army XP to do army reform. Lessons of war would be nice. Army reform would be good too. More organization, defense, max entrenchment. But, are we going to invest into one of these land doctrines? I think we're going to start with one of the land doctrines first. Grand battle plan. I always do superior firepower because it's just so good. I don't want to do mobile warfare. We don't have the energy for that. Grand battle plan wouldn't be bad. Mass assault would, makes a lot of sense for us. But we don't need that extra population, probably. Someday I'll go back uh, and do all the stuff, but honestly, supply consumption minus 10% is pretty good. Resistance, you know, it's not bad, but I'm, I always go superior firepower. It's just so nice, you know? It's always so nice. Radio detection is good, too. Good. Auto saving. Keep killing these divisions off, please. Andres to join the People's Vanguard. Also, we did we are sacrificing Hunan to make sure we can go to kill out Guangzhou first, so. That's a, that was originally the plan. Cancel material support, that's fine. Oh, get over that river. We need Nanning. And uh Liu Geking, Master Soldier. Ooh. Or Master Infiltrator. Ooh, yes. Pan Han Hanyan. Oh, that's really cool. Nanning is a frontline city. Oh hello. The Qing government is now just fighting against us. Okay. 
Well, we must be ready. Intensify reconstruction efforts. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Liberation of the Chinese woman. No, nah, I don't care. Uh, renovate the Jingling. Yeah, we're going to do that one. We read that one last time, so. How many days do we have to wait? Oh, we got them. Nice job, everybody. No, nah, we're going to take all that. Take all of it. There you go. So before they do that to us, we're going to come over here and do this. Uh, how many days do we have? Because I would like to take out the Yunnan clique as well, but... Unknown focus, huh? Well, let's take a look-see. Because if not, we'll get up here, try to beat them as fast as we can. That's why I made so many divisions up here, too, so... Oh, we've got divisions up here, too. Down here. That's fine. Formation of the Moscow Accords. Alright. That's fine. You are a cavalry-ish type of leader. Ish. There you go. Oh, that's good enough for now. Yeah, whatever. If you know dies, though, that would be really beneficial for us. You know what? I can take you guys and actually send you here instead. The southern front to focus on these guys, and perhaps. Fucking, yeah, that would be, wouldn't be bad. They divided uh, a clash for Canton and they divided a sister party. Uh, it's the largest faction movement within the League of Chinese Syndicalists. The Chinese Syndicalist Party boasts the most union membership and followers in China. With inspiration from the glorious revolutionaries of Britain and France following the Great War, the old guard of the Chinese Syndicalists has a party, such as party members Chen Duji, Li Li San, and Liu Xiaoqi, believe that in order for the proletarian socialist revolution to happen, the national revolution must be first won. When the KMT was reorganized in 1924, the Syndicalists and the KMT worked together in pledge of so unity, so called Union for Ind Front. Ideally, the Orthodox Syndicalists of the CSP envisioned a system akin to the Commune of France, with the unions and councils working together in tandem. The ongoing civic and political turmoil of the French state, however, has led to doubts towards the leadership of the Orthodox CSP. Within the LCS, criticism has first come from groups ranging from anarchists to the radical faction of the CSP regarding cooperation with the Chinese KMT, the Chen Du Zhu. The all-class revolution is only from a revolution possible for the proletariat at the stage in time. The policy of the United Front is successful has been successful in organizing both the failed 1932 Shanghai Uprising and the NRA success in the League War. Nonetheless, the Orthodox faction finds himself pulled at the hands of the KMT's own factional struggle, splitting the LCS's tense coalition. There is little doubt that the elders of the World Society are sitting closer to the PAC in beliefs and that the radicals of the CSB find common ground with the radicals of the RCA. As the LCS begins to unravel and fighting once more, the Orthodox faction is a choice. Decide with one of the major factions of the KMT or to continue the course of independence from the Nationalist Party politics. Ah, oh, it doesn't really matter. We're going to move this way. The Clash for Canton. And our comrades arms. Uh, I'm going to mind a nationalist railway. Yeah. Long as the Chinese workers have been forced to toil, sweat, and bleed for the dark and steaming mines and railways of the imperialist colonizers who have exploited Chinese resources and raw wealth for their own. With the success of the National Revolution in Eastern China, we shall seek to take over all foreign railway industries and tracks in order to utilize the strength of the Chinese nation. Guangzhou, and indeed Guangdong, the province as a whole, was in many ways the birthplace of the KMT Revolution. Many revolutionaries that are, are Cantonese are of deep ties to the region, and as a result, it was no surprise that its liberation caused great celebration within the party. President Wang Jingwei gave a triumphant address to great fanfare before a crowd at the end of, of the old Wampula site, echoing Dr. Sun, uh, Dr. Sun's address at the Academy's opening ceremony in 1924. But as the jubilant mood recedes, the troubles begin officially. Governors, the title now reclaimed, renamed chairman of the provincial government, are supposed to be elected by the uh, local party of provincial congresses. Practi practically, however, with local cells still in disarray, governance has been administered in an odd, ad hoc basis. With the sheer symbolic, symbolic importance of Guangdong, the new provisional chairman will likely be decided by the Central Executive Committee. Um, the residence faction has put its way behind Chen Yaozhu, a Guangzhou, Guangdong civil servant in the late 20s, and Chen Bi Chun's the younger brother. The manager strong arm the reluctant RCA to back his candidacy but Wang, embarrassed by the shameless nepotism has expressed some openness in hearing of the candidates. Sun Fo and the Reconstruction Faction are backing uh, Liang Han Kao, a legislator with experience as a Guangzhou party secretary. Both factions have the same idea in mind, have their associate take control of the region's fruitful patronage networks to build a fortress for the camp. Song Ching Ling and Deng Yan Da for the part of have an ace up their sleeve. General Chen Ming Shu, in the face of the Productive People's Party, a KMT splinter group in Guangzhou during Chen Jiang Ming's rule, continues to be a bastion of regional politics. Despite his checkered past siding with opponents of the party, he has attempted to return to the fold along with the PPP. 
The Mingan leadership uh, had testified that they played an integral part in supplying the insurgency with smuggled arms and should be rewarded. Other protests that the allowing military officer to hold the position would dilute the civilian leadership over a revolution. Lang Hang Kao, the prince's right-hand man. Uh, Chen Yaozu, the chairman's brother-in-law. Chen Mingxin, the provincial general. Nice. So if we can move fast enough, we can capitulate these guys. I would love to take out the Yunnan clique, but if they could lose Kunming faster, that'd be great. Oh, crap, never mind. Well, this is going to be quite an issue for us, then. Um, if we could fight these guys really fast, and then... Ooh, Nanjing is their government. How many divisions do they have? I might have to replay some of this, then. Well, up to 59, which is not terrible. Shadows of the countryside. When the KMT first liberated the five provinces at the end of the League War, the peasants and workers were overjoyed. Many flocked to the streets to welcome the advancing National Revolutionary Army, and cheered when KMT leaders spoke of national revolution. So far, the revolution has brought little but death and misery. Overwhelmed by radical sentiment, fanatical CRS aligned detachments or CSP radical aligned militia parades, and brawl in the streets threatening people high and low deemed reactionary. The NRA high command struggles to rein them in, even as their actions grow more and more blatant. It's far worse in the countryside, away from the capital and rural villages and hamlets. One strong holds for the PAC and their agrarian cooperative ideals. Fear permeates the air. Many turn away from the song of the PAC, seeking protection from the utter mayhem plaguing the nation. Across the land, radicalized peasants turn to the RCA and CSB radicals, organizing militias that often rove about to stamp out reactionaries. Others live in fear of an unarmed Lao Ban, whose reach appears to grow by the day. While CRS paramilitaries leave the NRA garrisons to stamp out communes they deem too autonomous, in response, worrying reports have emerged that some landlords have been allowed to return as people as a people of tired political radicalism. In light of these developments, the PAC's doubled down on the strongholds, stripping away various aligned NRA detachments to guard aligned villages, adding to the disarray. With the countryside in chaos, something must be done and fast because the revolutionary dream is dying. We reign on the CRS fanatics. Radicalism within the party increased by a huge amount. Time down CSP radicals. Drastic actions needed or the revolution is doomed. Oh, just in time. That's fantastic. There you go. Um, we can do what else here? Mm, that'd be okay. Mechanized units. Some pragmatic compromises have to be made even as we begin sweeping changes to our military structure. Du Yuming is a long-time WM uh, ARCA commander but has expressed willingness to lead in the creation of a mechanized force. Proof that politics does not have to get in the way of professionalism. Uh, mobile strike force for a revolutionary army will give us a key advantage over our warlord rivals. So I replayed basically where we left off up to and, and then we actually got Yunnan under us, which is actually really kind of cool. Thank you, Yunnan, for uh, joining in. Um, in the meantime, we got a couple things to do, especially to integrate the Guangdong Arsenal. First erected by the Viceroy of Ling Guang, Ling Guang in 1873, the Guangdong Arsenal got its staff as a, or start as a Guangdong Machinery Bureau producing light arms. Gradually, it was expanded and modernized, constructing new facilities and absorbing other arsenals like Zengbu Arms and Bureau to create a powerful military industrial complex in Guangdong. The Xinai Revolution and ensuing war saw Guangzhou become the center of succession of uh, southern governments, and Guangdong's arsenals role and continue to expand, assisted by other regional arsenals at like at Xinjiang, Pajilang, and even a dedicated gas mask factory that facilitates the southern China will be one of the greatest services to the nation's cause. And then there's also Integrate Wampo Dock Company. The Hong Kong and Wampoa Dock Company was founded by Douglas Lap Pryke and Thomas Sutherland in 1866, often abbreviated Wampoa Dock or Kowloon Docks, that effectively monopolized shipping in the Pearl River Delta across the 1870s. The Canton region has traditionally been a center for external trade, and its location made it both an asset and a target in the South China Sea. We should integrate these newly acquired facilities in our navy. So we're going to do that one. We actually did some army reforms because we had a fight, man, we fight a war against the uh, Guangxi clique down here. And we're trying to move around and do whatever we can here to um, support our cause and whatnot. So we're doing, actually, we're doing all right. No, we're losing a lot of battles here. We're going to be losing a lot of men. We're going to lose a lot of territory. But we got Wuhan. So I'm not super upset about this. That's why I made so many divisions here. You know, it made all sense. So we got a circle of two divisions. Uh, they're not... Actually, that's a division, good division to get rid of. And this is what? A good division to get rid of, too. So, whatever we do here, we're inserting uh, basically our dominance. We'll lose a lot of guys, but then again, we're China, so I don't, I'm not really concerned about that. The faster we finish this off, the better. Oh, now they also went to war with uh, these guys up here, too. Okay. Cuba's doing the rocks back. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Here, get in there. Come on, there's two divisions. They've got to die. We get almost no political power, but that's alright. Also, the more uh, attacks we do, the more army speed we get. So, also did to complete the revolutionary mission. Even as Dr. Sun approached the end of his life, he dreamed that the party would one day march north from its bases in Guangzhou to liberate the nation, topping the failed Bai Yang government. Although we knew it was unlikely to see the day, finally succumbing to cancer in Beijing during the negotiations, with our forces gathered, we will finally meet him there in that city once again. 
We'll march for the freedom of the nation, for the eternal premier's sake, for we will not fail and fall. Getting there. Oh, another segment too. Look at that. One, two, three divisions. It's not much, but it's a start. Oh, and they're also fighting these guys up here too. Oh god. I don't want to fight Japan yet. I don't think we're ready to fight Japan yet. We'll start trying to fix our military. Follow Beijing. Alright. Get your butts in there. Hey, even more in sequence. Yay. It is 1938, everybody. We're having a good old time, and yeah, we've got to go back and research this stuff. Oh. Very nice. Infantry equipment's good. Sure. I should probably research some, some more plane stuff, too. Good. And they are done there. And they're going to be done there. Nationals of Railways. Uh, the Ministry of Communication. Propaganda can be disseminated in various ways from pamphlets and newspapers, but also through modern methods such as broadcasting and radio. By direct order of the Central Committee, we'll create a Ministry of Communications to accomplish its task of national broadcasting. Not only must we win these words of unification, but we also must win the hearts and minds of the people. Oh, just go to Xi'an. Can we just take that? Can we just finish the war here? Oh, they're done. So, which is not good, either. So we're going to take as much as we possibly can. Um... Yeah, that's a plan. Uh, I want to prevent them from getting anything here too. So, can we take them all? Because I'd like to take the ships too. All right, that was way easier than I thought it would be, but that probably puts us in a not so great location or position. Support the CSA? Probably not. Offer an alliance with the Guoming, Guomin-jun? Cast adrift by the changing circumstances in China, or Alice and Taiyuan. Taiyuan. A nonetheless managed to prevail in face of the shifting tides of the nation. Given their alignment towards us, we shall become begin negotiations to force join forces together and bring about a shared vision for the future. Increase integration in Yunnan. Hey, you got six ships. Six more than we started with. Not bad. Uh, blockade runner? Sure. We're also probably going to need a blockade runner. Oh god, what do we have here? We're gonna need a lot of guns, aren't we? Guns and trucks. There you go. Maybe a train or two. Alright, so they cancel their military support, that's fine. Not bad though, overall. Let's see, point two a day. The completion of the Northern Expedition. About a decade ago, Chiang Kai-shek addressed his officers on the eve of the Northern Expedition. The importance of this fight is not only that it will decide the fate of the warlords, but whether or not the Chinese nation and the race can restore their freedom and independence hangs in the balance. In other words, it's a struggle between the nation and the warlords, between the revolution and the counter-revolutionaries, between the three people's principles and imperialism. The KMT was knocked down then, but the fight never ended. Today, the blue sky, white sun, and holy red earth finally was raised over the change by Beijing as party members both that witnessed the first expedition and those that joined in the interim cheered on. As Wang Jingwei and other party members delivered their speeches, soldiers paraded and experts speculated about the future that there was little doubt of the significance of the moment. Victory, yes, victory. Victory over the warlords, victory over the counter-revolutionaries, victory over imperialism. Jing and many others did not live to see the moment, but their legacy is secure. The Kuomintang has proven themselves capable of more than just words, casting down the institutions they so hated. Even if resistance continues and enemy pockets are mopped up, the nation is changing. Socialism appears more and more as a credible future for China, and the Kuomintang no longer as a mere fringe party. But threats remain. Heavy is the head that wears a crown, and the party's newfound legitimacy has drawn the attention of a host of foes, both at home and abroad. Meanwhile, it fights to avoid being undone by the influx of opportunists, divisions, and new responsibilities. The people are now expect them to lead, and that's far more often difficult than to overthrow. We have a lot of work ahead of us. We get devastated economy in just early NRA. Oh, wait, we didn't have to cancel that. Well, come on. God dang it. If I have Eastern China. Birthplace of the Second Revolution. They have completely rebelled the region of the former League of Eight Provinces, given additional bonus upon the completion of the Northern Expedition. Oh. Well, dang it, I shouldn't cancel that order. Well, it's a repatriated, second repatriated Congress. Entrenched Dong Guo. National Health Administration. Oh, Academia Sinica. New Day in Beijing. Beijing is renamed by Baiping. Compliance, way more. The Disbandment Conference. It's not bad. We still have a lot to do here, though. <laughs> uh, going down here, I guess we we'll do this one, the Northern Expedition Avenged. It's finally been done, the revolutionary mission passed down to us from Dr. Sun, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. It's finally been achieved, this time without intervention of the German Empire. 
The National Revolution is secured in both Nanjing and Beijing. The town's grounds for the rest of China finally come together under the leadership of the KMT. Zhang Guo, Ming Guo, Wang Sui. My god, do we need some political power. Oh! What's going on down here? Looks like there's a lot of fighting. A lot of forts, too. Well, a new dame by Ping. Following the reconquest of Beijing from the perfidious warlords and the so-called emperor that ran our country into ruin, the imperial capital is not falling in our hands. We're going to a new mastership over China. We shall rebuild the devastated city and a new nationalist image. We'll start by restoring the city's name of Bai Ping to distance it from the old order, bestowing it a more modest name. That's to get more wars, but we don't need, though. But we have military factory, civilian factory. Good stuff. We need way more artillery. Gotta go any workers front, nice. Uh let's see with this one. Do we get more stuff? Technically, yeah. Not bad. Repossess national armaments. That's not bad. So I would like more political power though. Chart the military regions. Oh, well, that's not bad either. That's pretty good too, actually. Host the second Congress? I guess we could. The Chinese Nationalist Party has succeeded where so many have failed, and as such, it's appropriate once more to convene a grand congress of leftists, revolutionaries, patriots, and other like-minded individuals to draft and plan out the next phase of the Chinese Revolution. Topics to the discussion will range from economic reform to dealing with the ever-present threat of the Japanese Empire. There we go. That's a flag. Uh, the, uh, uh, white sun, blue sky, and holy red earth now flies above the Tiananmen uh, Gate above a recently saw portrait of the later eternal premier Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Calls have gone up throughout the country to convene a special emergency session of the National Congress. While traditionally orthodox party the doctrines call for these meetings every four years, the developments of the National Revolution have instead suspended this procedure in favor of calling sessions when needed. Chairman Wang Jingwei once again has been given the honor of opening the Congress to commemorate the success of the Northern Expedition. But observers of the Congress remark that the mood within the delegates is considerably more tense than in the first Congress. There are certainly rumors in the dark of knives about being sharpened, especially among those who oppose Chairman Wang's gravitation towards authoritarianism. While the left KMT now controls the former imperial capital of Beijing, strengthening its legitimacy as a national unifier, there's so much work to be done to win the people's hearts and minds and drive the Japanese imperialists out of China once and forevermore. The Congress has also seen greater participation in revolutionary women within the ranks of the KMT. Most notable are those such as Deng Ying Chao, Zheng Jing, Kai Cheng, and Jiang Jingyu, uh, who all hold long ties to the Chinese socialist movement, but also newcomers such as the wife of the Uyghur, Uyghur politician, Burhan Shadidi, and the deputy director of Jiang Jiang's Women's Federation, Rashida. Furthermore, in attendance are members of the International Military Mission in China, yet another reminder that Rev International's uh, staunch support for the success of the Socialist Chinese Revolution, and without do further ado, Wang's concluding remarks on the importance of unity drew only polite applause as the Congress delegates began to take the floor. Well, get on with it. The fate of Puyi. When it supposes a ch oh, hello, child in 1912 and put in de facto house arrest in the Forbidden City, few thought Puyi would ever be a threat, of course. Um, after all, the monarch was deeply unpopular, and the fledgling republic had far more pressing problems to deal with than the hapless toddler. But at last, strongmen came and started with Yuan Chi Kai, and many ignorantly attempted <clears throat> to hoist a monarchy onto the people. Uh, the Germans, all, in all their arrogance, insisted on restoring Puyi as a so called birthright, as if snuffing out the Xinhai dream could be any more complete. But the Republican dream of freedom did not die with the end of the Northern Expedition. And now, with the Republic at last restored across China, this leaves one final matter to attend as we turn to the page in China's story. Puyi has grown into a vile, wicked man, taught little practical skills and a sadistic, childish personality. Or our so called propaganda says, the reality is that the man has been a puppet his entire life, and Wang Jingwei has already ruled out a public execution of the deposed emperor's successor. There's little for a government to gain besides unneeded comparisons to Lenin, so there remains few options. The first would be to simply exile him to whichever state he's willing to take him in. While this would effectively wash the government's hands of this matter, some question of this would pose a major security risk. Another possibility is order him confined in the forbidden city under house arrest, keeping him out of sight until he dies forgotten. Many, however, feel it's still too similar to the unpopular articles written after Puyi's first abdication, and also allows for an effective embodiment of reaction or evil to go unpunished for his treasonous deeds. The final, perhaps the most radical proposal, would be to attempt to rehabilitate Puyi. What's it entail a substantive effort to train the man to live like his fellow citizens as another comrade in a larger revolution? Exile? House arrest? Showing the true glories of socialism. Jun Tong Sleepers form. Ages of left KMT are on the move. Ever since the victory of the League, the KMT and the Raz have swelled in numbers with pockets of sympathizers scattered all over the nation. 
Some are true believers, educated in socialism's promises, and disgruntled with the status quo. Some are veterans of China's various Republican armies who have thrown their lot with a new hope. Many are graduates of Wampo, whose nationalistic or revolutionary spirit has been reawakened by the party's return still. Plenty are simply men or women with their own private grudges, or perhaps bought off by the prospect of social mobility. Dai Chongfeng has organized his attachments carefully, selecting leaders often from men he knew from his Wampo days. Uh, Zheng Jimin has been sent southwards to set up camp in Guangdong, while the Hunan branch has been assigned to Tangzong. Further west, cells have been established in the mountains under Qiu Kali, uh, Kaiji, and Kunming and Zheng Guangqing in Chengdu. Northwards, defunct cells under Chiao Chai Kai and Ma, uh, Ma Han San have been reactivated, and contact made with Manchuria based freedom fighters led by Guang Jiangqing and the various location cities. Different station chiefs have been appointed, most notably Shanghai Station Chief Shen Zui. Closest to the center powers, Dai's childhood friend Mao Rengfang, a side to the east, helping coordinate them is Wei Daming, a prominent communications officer. These men, and the hundreds beneath them, have gone into the belly of the beast, putting their lives in jeopardy for the cause. We can only hope that their sacrifice will be worth it one day. Go forth, Knights of the Revolution, and grand ambitions for a new republic. First on the Congress agenda was to implement the party's uh, state mass bureaucracy into a greater national form. Uh, that Kuomintang is not only a political organ for the next pivotal years of political tutelage, uh, but also a guiding force to train and teach the masses revolutionary consciousness, and so that the Chinese people themselves could find a to imperialism as such. A near unanimous vote approved proposals um, to establish a formal Ministry of Education and a National Health Administration. The Ministry of Education is to be led by one of the four elders of the Kuomintang and members of the World so uh, uh, Society, Kai Yuan Pai. Kai commanded a great amount of prestige due to his work in years of reforming the Beijing University nearly a decade earlier, as perhaps himself a philosophical anarchist, and advocates combining labor and earning, learning and education. Basic to the conception of a new revolutionary education is the recruitment of students and laborers into the education system, thus ending the monopolization of education by the wealthy. Along with the planned construction of the Academia Sinica, there will also be an industrial labor college, and an agricultural labor college, and a social sciences college. The third choice reflecting the anarchist ideas that the social sciences and social revolution were inseparable. Uh, rural health conditions in China's country are utterly deplorable by modern medicine standards, and in some cases, midwives resort to using now dung or mud to stop the bleeding during delivery. Holy crap. The promotion of public health is not only seen as an extension of Min Qing, the people's welfare, but also reflects Dr. Sun's belief that a physically strong people cannot be so easily conquered. As a result, a national health administration has been founded by the Ministry of the Interior. Its goals are to create mobile clinics and public health stations, enforce vaccinations, and train local midwives and nurses in modern medicine uh, techniques. With pressure from the PAC, the administration's first experimental health clinics will be established in the former Min Gan Zone. We turn dreams into reality. Of course we do. That's us. As we will start to uh, uh, push in once we get every guys, all of our guys on the line. Oh, good job, Albania. The language issue. As the Congress drags on, one of the main questions answers out of the language. Uh, nearly 300 million native speakers of its northern dialect are Mandarin in China, and the south there are 37 million who speak Wu. The dialect is Zhejiang. 22 million speak Cantonese, 20 million speak Hakka, and several million speak the Fujian dialect. During the wars of unification, there were undoubtedly incidents in which language and familiarity led to chaos within the armed forces across the country. While the northern Chinese dialect of Mandarin continues to dominate use in the official language of the government, there is an emerging argument between those insists that Mandarin be standardized and used for cultural, official, and educational purposes. There are those who support the cultural protection of China's many languages, too. Proponents of radical language reform, especially among radical socialists, argue that the character system must be simplified to promote mass literacy across the country. However, they are opposed uh, by the more traditionalists within the Kuomintang. They argue that this extensive of language simplification will strip characters and words of their original meaning and cultural sophistication. A compromise was reached, however, with the Ministry of Education first publishing a list of Goyin common vocabulary, which includes popular simplified characters and determines the standard phonetic system. Furthermore, it also proposed the creation of a committee on the unification of lang national languages to organize simplified characters already in circulation as standard characters. However, this is far from radical character reform and does not seek to, to change many existing characters in the Chinese Hanzi. China must be united one way or another. A midnight meeting. And the dead of night after a discreet villa, uh, near a discreet villa, a young and somewhat inebriated officer approaches. He's a faceless man, uh, deliberately wearing a drab, monotonous outfit, ca calculated to prevent the man from standing out as he conducts the labor of hound and horse, as so he calls it. He carries with him a proposition from his master. Inside is one of the fledgling republic's most uh, eminent figures, perhaps the third most influential figure in the old Mingan insurgency. 
but the circumstances are grim. And he shoots out his hand, pick guards to the meeting room. He's not fooled by this guest act, watching the man's wolfish eyes dart around for weakness as he speaks. In the paranoid uh, atmosphere that permeates the land, conspiracies and furtive meetings uh, are all too common, but this perhaps eclipses all others in its scale. Plot against the leader of the very party they claim to serve. Dai Chun Feng, the guest begins by reminding General Deng Yanda of the common struggle together in the insurgency, which soon devolves into a rant about how the Paris Committee had swooped in to steal all the glory despite hiding in safety for nearly a decade. He insists on he and the other officers are willing to fight to protect the revolution from Wang's folly and propose an alliance with unspecified conditions against him. He is already armed with political areas of coordination between their respective factions. Deng is quickly to show his annoyance that Dai, equating his efforts to those of the insurgency barely concealing his disdain for the former gangster. He is well aware who Dai serves, who is Ong Nan, and his clique had long been undermining da Deng's authority for, within the army. With the chairman's power grow, the threat of tyranny hangs over the nation, and there is some temptation towards the use of special methods to keep the RCA at bay. As a veteran general stares down the officer who failed to graduate Wang Po with flaring contempt, he nonetheless contemplates his own labor of hound and horse for Song Jingling and the PAC. A deal in the dark is signed. Extremism is kept at bay. A deal in the dark. Relief of command, huh? Overwhelming firepower. Ideological loyalty? As China, as much as I like to do that, we don't need to do that one. Proper heritage? Chinese heritage? I'm going to go overwhelming firepower, so I can just go ahead and throw these on. Uh, not that guy. There you go. Gives a little more staying power here, too. National Reconstruction. Oh, word descends from the north. Oh, crap. Today, Grand Marshal Zeng of the Fengxing government has declared that within one year he'll begin his war of national reclamation and strikes south against us. Whether or not he's Japan's part, there'll be a great struggle ahead for the end. There can only be one China. National Reconstruction. Years of economic stagnation and government failures made the Chinese economy an utter laughingstock in the eyes of the modernized and industrialized West. If China has reserved her historical position as a leading power in Asia, then, like Japan before, she must take it upon herself to rapidly industrialize and modernize. The end of the discourse on the National Reconstruction are none other than Central Committee members uh, Chen Gongbo and Song Ziwen. Both Song and Chen see China as an economically colonized country forced to let the foreign powers extract raw materials and invade its markets, thus hindering oh, China's own industrial development. Chen and Song are influenced by international developments in the Commune of France, the Union of Britain, and interestingly enough, even the Russian Svobodniks. To conceptualize the concept of autarkic industrialization or the reorientation of the economy along lines of dirigisme and corporatism. They plan for the development of a national economic council which shall seek to utilize central economic planning development through a centrally managed production teams, the mobilization of agriculture in support of urban industrialization, and a corporatist relationship between governments and private businesses, allocated by the state of course, by nationalizing and monopolizing foreign trade. Chen Gongbo has argued that the state would gain additional means to build capital. The ultimate goal of the state capitalist model is to develop the Chinese economy while also preventing the new Chinese Republic from siding into or sliding into bourgeois capitalism. Certainly, there may be some capitalists who would grow rich in the process of harnessing a private capital, but according to Chen Gongbo, they will not have developed sufficient strength to subvert the economic system of the party state. A new direction is needed to combat capitalism. Entrenching Dongguo and pursuit of the people's welfare. Probably go this way to get into the research slot. Min Sheng is a belief ensuring that the Chinese people have access to equal opportunities and livelihoods. The late founding father of the party, Dr. Sun, believed that livelihood must be expanded to areas of clothing, food, housing, and mobility. Under the nationalist government, we shall take steps to ensure that society draws closer to this principle. Like I said before, we're not going to win every battle, but the main goal is to get a crop to more army XP. Uh, when the Kuomintang first liberated the five provinces at the end of the League War, uh, the peasants and workers were overjoyed. Many flocked to the streets to welcome the advancing National Revolutionary Army and cheered when Kuomintang leaders spoke of national revolution. Uh, so far, the revolution has brought little but death and misery. Oh, I think we were this earlier before, too. If you're going to do this, please go ahead. I don't want to lose political power. We're going to lose. Oh, we get totalism here, though. The national anthem. With the unification of the China proper under the sword and flag of the Kuomintang, uh, efforts have been made to consolidate national rule with the proper Chinese anthem. The previous anthem of the Baoying Republic, Song to the Auspicious Cloud, or Auspicious Cloud, uh, and other anthems have been announced as being backwards or irrelevant to the modern Chinese revolutionary struggle. Furthermore, the National Anthem Commission has been assigned to create a patriotic song to rally the millions of people that make up the Chinese nation, in order to bolster nationalism as part of the party's current Minzu. While some radical socialists within the KMT and the League of Chinese Syndicalists have proposed international, translated in vernacular Chinese by the syndicalist Ku Kui Bai, this move has attracted backlash from members of the Central Committee who believe that the lyrics of the National Anthem must reflect the principles held dear by our late Premier Dr. Sun Yat-sen. As such, many are in favor of adopting Professor Cheng Mao Yun's Three Principles of the People, which traces its lyrics to a speech Sun Yat-sen gave in 1924. Alternatively, a suggestion has been arisen from the Chinese musician Huang Zhu, with lyrics taken from a poem written by the prominent right-wing Kuomintang ideologue Dai Jitao, 
While not as popular as the other two options, the song has also been suggested to be played at the rising and lowering of our national flag. Three principles? More radicalism, huh? Why not? No, we're not winning down here in the center. The North has actually done pretty darn well so far. The closing of the Congress. Chairman Wang Jingwei stepped forward one last time for the conclusion of the party's second Congress. Uh, giving an eloquent speech lauding the martyrs and sacrifices made during the Second Northern Expedition. From the League War to the capture of Beijing, many revolutionary comrades have fallen along the way, and the, bus, the, far, the fight is far from over. As long as imperialism remains in China, China cannot call herself free. The time has come for the KMT to take up its natural, natural destiny as a true revolutionary vanguard to lead the Chinese people into the new era of respect and prestige. The conclusion of the Second Congress has nonetheless raised some growing intensifying debates between members of the Provisional Action Committee and the Reorganized Comrades Association. The shaky united front between the party's major factions, as well as other minor outlying factions of the National Revolution, is starting to unravel, as there is no longer such a dominant call for unity. Growing criticism has been leveled towards Wang, who many in the PAC worry will simply seek to probably delegate tutelage or merely hand over the power nepotistically to friends and family. And Chen Gongbo has not been unrelenting at all in his insults to Deng Yanda, with Chen likening Deng and his military circles to a Bonapist, a Bonapartist, and arguing that the PAC will not bring about democracy but rather use the military rule. All the while, that was once more hushes has grown significantly in some extremist circles of the NRA, talks of radicalism brewing if the party's leadership cannot resolve itself. So there's much to be done before the Coleman thing can truly settle down. The national revolution must be continue on, and the phase of tutelage uh, cannot end until imperialism is firmly driven out of the country. We have a lot of work to do in the march to unification. With Beijing and Nanjing and Kuomintang hands for the first time in the, in the party's history. Oh, look at that. A party has certainly achieved a greater degree of legitimacy than ever before. Nonetheless, warlords still remain in either vague, loose alliances with the life, left Kuomintang or outright opposed to Kuomintang's claims to national leadership. The Manchurian problem continues to evacuate Kuomintang, and the National Revolutionary Army molds its chances of liberating this integral Chinese territory from the Fengzhong warlords. The people of Northeast have fallen victim to these bandits, and the Fengzhong government's position is shored up by the lackey status of Japan's imperialistic co prosperity sphere. In the coming days, it will not be uh, unexpected to see Zhang Zulin mobilize his forces in a desperate attempt to end the na second northern expedition, or see Japan intervene against the Kuomintang due to the latter's openly anti-imperialist stance. Uh, the legation cities and other concessions in China must also be dealt with severely as a Chinese nationalist party. These regions are integral Chinese lands. Unlawfully stolen in humiliation by the shameful treaties and brutal invasions, once the Kuomintang successfully concluded the national unification and phase of political tutelage, there is no doubt that left KMT will seek to demand the restoration of all foreign owned Chinese territories. We must reach China no matter what the cost is. Left Kuomintang military reforms. Look at this. The first steps of reforming the military are underway. The creation of a centralized bureaucracy to coordinate logistics, supply, and payment. A commission to handle this project was established, with trusted men supposedly handpicked by Wang Jingwei taking on this task with stride. This lays a foundation for future army reforms, critical for bringing our forces to the modern era of war. Our armies triumph even off the battlefield. Look at that. Fantastic. Academica Seneca. The Academia Seneca was created after the Second Repatriated Congress of the Kuomintang following the passage of the Organic Law of the Academica, uh, Academia Seneca, a project proposed by the World Society. The Academia or Ac Academy is directly under the national government and shall offer classes a multitude of subjects from geology to new modern Western ideas such as psychology. Institute of Revolutionary Practice. Oh, weekly war support. As their territories grow significantly larger in size from the former insurgency regions of the Mingan Zone and then to the National Revolutionary Government, we must remind comrades of the true revolutionary nature of their mission. Furthermore, we must help the people realize their revolutionary consciousness and turn them into a revolutionary vanguard. Alright, at this point you're gonna hold. We've lost a lot of guys. 24,000 versus 19,000, which is actually not too extremely terrible. Better trucks, good. I hope we don't lose this tile. We need more guns, we need more arty. It's pretty normal from here on out. There you go. A shitty empire. It's nice. What do we got here? Uh, that would be good too. Keep it has gone. gone. Nice. 
with Zong Chan's suit exposing popularity. Uh, what well, the Republican China was proclaimed in 1911, the Xinhai Revolution, the style of dress worn at the time in China was heavily influenced by the Manchu tradition. But both the uh, Qi Pao and the Changshan were imposed upon the Han peoples by the Qing as a form of cult social control. An attempt to modernize not just Chinese nation, but the Chinese society came to the Maji Restoration effect on the changing of Japanese dress. Chinese intellectuals in the elite began to combine elements of both Western and Chinese dress. The Zongshan Kusu, therefore, is a product of such cultural revolution. The tunic was introduced by the founder of the KMT himself, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, and features a suit based on Japanese cadet uniform. The four pockets on the suit are said to represent the four virtues of pro propriety, justice, honesty, and shame, while the five bonnets of the tunic represent the five branches of the nationalist government. The suit's popularity since the nationalist government's return to the mainland has exploded in popularity. Government officials frequently don the suit as a symbol of proletarian unity and as an eastern counterpart to the western business suit. A humble outfit for great change. Yeah, not bad. Hey, yeah, we're out of stuff, so they're going to give us stuff. Nice, I love it. Just give us more stuff. Give us the stuff. Give us all the stuff. Let me guess you can't get over there, can you? God dang it. But I guess you can get over here. Guess we don't have to cross the river over here. Okay, they also move left here too. Okay. All right. We're out of equipment, but they're out of equipment. We're all out of equipment. Yeah, everybody. We want equipment. Can you do that and just like really speed it across the river? Probably not, in all honesty. Festivals and superstitions in New China. Eradicate all religious and social superstitions. Eradicate superstition to cleanse the cradle of the revolution. Uh, this, mid this year's mid-autumn festivals with festivities have found themselves interrupted by a slew of posters and articles announcing the seemingly superstitious nature of traditional Chinese festivals. Uh, instead of attending the festivals and eating mooncake, uh, some revolutionary-minded individuals decided to attend anti-superstition assemblies organized by the Social Customs Reform Committee. In Xinjiang, where there are many branches uh, belonging to the Reorganized Commerce Association, party members of the Xinjiangese RC have urged government officials to prohibit traditional holidays such as the Mid-Autumn Festival in order to preserve Nanjing's identity as a cradle of the revolution. That's very odd, but okay. Um, the RCA politician Zhu Fo Hai was serving as Zhejiang's local SCRC chairman has declared that there are still about three stages to human development. The age of the divine, the age of the imperial sovereignty, and finally the age of popular sovereignty, Min Quan. As the later is a, or latter is a current age of the Chinese revolution, so it must be true that the people must abandon their favorable uh, traditional and superstitious worship of the moon. His comments were met favorably by many in the radical faction of the RCA, some of whom, like Chen Gongbo, have expressed that a total cultural revolution is needed to purify the degenerate aspects of old China. As such efforts around the local villages and towns who are protesting this seemingly intrusive move into one's own local culture. Local leaders have voiced their opposition to the Kuomintang overreach, charging that the RCA is seeking to subvert local cultures and are seeking to overthrow centuries of tradition. After significant protests, the national government is relative for this year. Though it's clear the broader battle is not over. A snapshot of New China is being built. What are we doing here? Nice. Wow, we can't win anything here, can we? That's really bad, actually. Okay, they completely abandoned the area up here. Oh, crap. We've got to finish this war now. Zhu Qian passes away. Are they manually just fine or not? No, no, that's not good. Out of the Qing Dynasty fell in 1911, there have been many would-be lawbringers who sought to create justice and reform China. Few would have been as honest or influential as Zhu Qian, uh, a founding father of the Republic's judicial system. Born in Nanchang, he successfully passed an imperial examination and went to work for the Ministry of Justice in 1907. He was a member of the uh, Dong Mengui when he became Deputy Minister of Justice under Tong Xiaoyi's cabinet, but resigned in protest in face of Yuan Shikai's power grab since then. He wrote a variety of posts in the Kuomintang, including a seat in the Central Executive Committee. The last such a prominent old guard member is a great tragedy for the party, even if he was lucky to pass from old age and having lived long enough to see the liberation of Beijing. And yet already, uh, the power of jockeying has begun. As compensation for his loss in the CECC, Wang Jingwei gave up the post of Minister of Justice in the revolutionary government. 
He's usually leaning towards the PAC, and the usual complaints about balance of power stream in from the same suspects. Wang is a little patient for another round of theatrics, and calls him rumbling after Liao Zongkai's death. Uh, Kai Yuan Pai, a former member, mentor of Wang, one of the esteemed elders of the party, stepped up to the plate, offering to take on the position. An educator by training, there's certain irony of an ex-anarchist becoming Minister of Justice, but perhaps that's part of his appeal as a compromise between the RCA, PAC, and LCS. And Wang's camp, Luo uh, Zhongkuang, uh, has emerged as a leading candidate, offering a recommendation from Zhu Volhai. Luo is a former radical from the CSP, a former lieutenant colonel under Zhang Zizhong, and his experience as a newspaper editor. Although in theory the Minister of Justice is nominated by the Premier of the Judicial Wang, the CEC has met privately to decide on which candidate to suggest the Premier. I don't mind going further to the left side for now. That's fine. So we've got to finish this war, like, now. Keep going in. We've reached over the river. I want you to hang out here. Everyone move in as we're going in. Good. Good. Construction speed, political power would be nice, too. The Disbandment Conference. Organized by the main military leaders of the National Revolutionary Army, the National Disbandment Commission is hereby established to deal with the NRA's bloated size and problem after the Second Northern Expedition. The, of uh, the post of Commander in Chief, field commanders, and other wartime tactical roles are to be abolished, and efforts are initiated to disband all superfluous troops. Good. You're here to literally just keep them in uh, the field, keep them where they're supposed to be. I don't care what it takes. We've got a giant war coming. Basic small airframes. Better engines. A champion for the workers and peasants? If the National Revolutionary Army had a face ever since uh, General Chiang's untimely death, it would be Deng Yanda. His story career has taken him to the halls of Wampoa, to the cities of Europe, the hills of Xinjiang, and other battlefields across China. With every success, his prominence rises, creating a powerful nucleus for the seeking an alternative to Wang's rule. But as a prestige soar, sometimes even his closest allies fear he's flying too close to the sun, and derogatory comments of a red Napoleon have quickly swirled. For now, though, public opinion remains on his side, and, does so, and so does the army as he passes. A military glory, a socialist hero, or a Bonapartist? Interesting. More army to form. How do we lose that tile? Hello? They have got to be out of guns, too. Like, come on. I need you guys to keep these guys in place. We've got to get in there. This is not a... That, that doesn't matter. Getting in here and circling all these soldiers would be the best thing possible. Oh my god, are you serious? Yeah, I think we're kind of screwed here. I hate these warlords. The warlords are the... The only thing that can take down China is China itself. Look at this. Li Jishen is a man with a story career. And a stack of their arduous job of serving as war minister, a political power broker, and also an acting general in the National Revolutionary Army. His recent victories has worked to promote an image of nonpartisanship in the high command, avoiding the hostile quarrels of Kuomintang political leadership. That said, Li owes his job as much as to politics as his military acumen, whether the past working with Li Guang, a political faction, range from Hu Hanmin, Chen Zhongming, and even the new Guangxi clique. He has leveraged these connections to cast himself as a mediator, but some wonder if this makes his, or masks his true loyalties with the right, or himself, the voice of reason in these uncertain times. Huh. This is so stupid. It's not funny. Neither one of these tiles. You're going to force defense, boys. I frankly do not care if you die. Of course. Okay, so I'm going to have to replay this because this is, this is ridiculously stupid. We've got more than enough divisions, more than enough strength, more than enough everything to make sure that we're okay up here. And then we can't d deal with these freaking warlords? Are you kidding me? 
We should easily be able to take this top. You know what? Before you do that, here, give us a second here. It's all your strength going. Come on. Come on, take this frickin' tile. You're gonna force the attack. Uh, let's see, we definitely need this too. I need you to win now. As they're just, they already took Beijing, so I'm probably, I broke, I'm gonna have to replay this off screen. Oh, this is annoying. This is incredibly stupidly annoying. God, I hate the Chinese when they hate themselves. Um, so let's see, what else are we gonna do here? Hmm, I'll get that one done. I'm French Dongguo. Legitimacy, fate of a fellow republic. War resistance. Yeah, establish a national healthcare administration. In spite of the advances in European healthcare, the National Health Administration is an organization established by the parties of the Ministry of Health. Inspired by Dr. Sun's belief that a physically weak nation could not survive in the competitive world, the NHA will accomplish this by creating vaccination and sanitation programs, local health clinics, and rural mobile health centers. All right, so I've replayed part of this as well, and at this point, we uh, well, we did get the, the these group this group under the Guangming Guangmin Zhu or whatever it was, and then when we got them under us, then they spawned the Shangxi. So the fallout of the Northeastern War, or Northwestern War, the panic, the bloodshed, the bodies, <clears throat> the refugees' horrible news floods into the Shangxi, and the indeed the rest of China, the Xiaibi San Mao collapsed under the weight of the Buddhist advances. Routed on the battlefield by the triumphant Mongolian Tibetan coalition, the various Sui clans have lost substantive territories in Guangchong, Qinghai, Sui Yan, and Ningxia, was left to the old monkly battered armies that fled into Gansun disgrace. The Hui, a predominantly Muslim ethnic group, see themselves as Chinese and are considered an integral part of the Chinese nation. By contrast, the Mongols and Tibetans are seen as secessionists, and the victory means that the Han Chinese majority of the possibility of losing core Chinese territory to rebel groups. And the chaos has ensued. Shangxi sent its arms into Gongsu ostensibly to help defend it from the marauding enemy forces, with little capability to resist. The remaining Hui leaders have laid down their arms, and Shangxi has met little resistance. It seems that the influence of Tianyan, or Taiyuan, now expand in the Northwest, and the potential for future violence looms a national calamity. So it actually works out pretty nicely for us. Um, we got those guys under us. Integrate these guys. Would like to. Without a revolution, so we're still trying to uh, get back to where we actually ended up. So political actions for the CSA moves and counter moves. Uh, the Hound has long slipped from its leash, a fact that many within the Kuomintang central leadership has come to regret. The National Revolutionary Army, a force designed specifically to protect the party from warlord and military control, slowly developed from a mind, a mind of its own, and rumors of military conspiracy swirls each faction court's sympathetic officers. Uh, we want this one. Um, Wang Jingwei is no stranger to this threat, and neither are those closest to him, although Wang has substantial control over the bureaucracy. The support of the least plurality of intellectuals and Chen Gongbo has whipped his C RCA into disciplined and albeit official caucus. While his position at the top uh, the, of the party has never felt quite secure. His wife, Chen Bujin, has a plan. A determined woman with a painful memories of all the power struggle her husband had with Chiang Kai-shek and knows all too well the power of the military in dictating party priorities. She has independently begun the legwork for creating a pro-chairman military faction. Soon that she has finally informed Wang in detail. With the help of Zheng Zizong, Zhu Enlai, and the advisors of the MMIC, she has drafted a list of members of the political department, the European trained syndicalist officers, and other young guard loyalists to install and to key positions in the NRA, NRA hierarchy. Such blame meddling in the army might just be enough to bring uh, the military to heal, breaking the independent political spirit. On the other hand, Wang is hesitant despite uh, Chen's rosy outlook, noting that the many NRA officers are generally apolitical and in such open demands of uh, political loyalty may backfire by driving them into the opposition. Um, Chen's open efforts to install her brother Chen Cheng Zhu as a general in the Air Force has caused plenty of blowback in the past, presenting an image of bringing a respectful, respectable statesman above, such petty victory might be the better route to keep his power. Then again, revolution is often a dirty business, and as president and commander in chief, it is his right to grant military commissions. Perhaps it's better to be feared than overthrown. Wang endorses proactive measures. Wang hesitates at such factionalism. Hmm. We do this one. Well. Military forms of progress. We're gonna need that against these guys, so. I just hope we're ready for whatever war. We do get basic stuff here. Oh, hello. Vermilion Society funds. Cut. We just received word from our agents in Shanghai that the mandate has undertaken a major crackdown uh, against our monetary operations. Whether Vermilion Society contracts for us to go into hiding, the mandate closely watching all monetary funds moving our way while we'll to tough it down and recuperate the funds another way. Darn the imperialists. So we just finished this one now. 
Oh, we didn't even do this one yet. Oops. We need to do New Day and buy Ping. We're gonna do this one too. Uh, repossess national arsenals. Focus will give us one additional military effect for each province city owned by us. Oh. That's cool. I could probably use them. Definitely use them. I really want to start working some planes, though. Uh, as a force of liberty China with a fervor of unification, we have seized multiple abandoned arms factories and arsenals left behind by the provincial warlords, many of whom have built up arms production facilities of their own of the years. Let us utilize these arsenals and upgrade them so they may serve the needs of the party and nation rather than the, another power-hungry regional tyrant. The story is Zeng Jiangxi. Perhaps due to her lineage, she was born to live a life of greatness, a remarkable life for a young new woman, in a new revolutionary age of Chinese politics. Descended from the renowned, uh, late Qing general, Zheng Guoquan, one of the brothers of the famous Zheng Guofan of the Xiang army that helped crush the Taiping Rebellion. Zheng Jiangxi was born on January 23, or 23rd, 1910, at uh, Bai Tang in Changsha, Hunan. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, schools across China began accepting more girls in Zheng as Yan Xi was a member of the basketball team of her local secondary school, under the influence of the Chinese uh, revolutionary and socialist Zhu Tali, Zheng threw herself into the National Revolution by joining the Northern Expedition uh, as one of the few women at the Wampo Military Academy. When the expedition failed, she fled for the Mingan insurgency, where she became a political instructor and a traffic coordinator for the insurgents. Her dedication and selflessness, or selfless commitment to the ideals of the National Revolution, have recently earned her praise from the upper echelons of the party, including Song Qingling, who has described her as the ideal Chinese re female revolutionary. In recent days, she's now the personal secretary of the Chinese state woman and wife of General Zhu Enlai, Deng Ying Chao, a heroic woman for our times. Beta the Bai Yang Army. While the Bai Yang and other warlord regimes were merely institutions of corruption and outlets for foreign imperialism uh, to exploit the Chinese people, there are certainly uh, those officers and generals who are progressive enough that they are willing to offer their services to the National Revolutionary Army. Oh, as a way to handle reconstruction faster, let us provide them with a commission so that they may now serve the party. Fate of Puyi, which we read earlier. Crossroads. A new slapstick comedy has emerged from the theaters uh, from the director Shen Jiling and starring Bai Yang and Zhao Dan. Oh, what else do we want here? We're going to need more of this, too. Um, while uh, comedic in nature, critics have pointed out that the film seeks to take on a political undertones in regards to the instability of the Chinese politics and the rising threat of Japan. Uh, it begins in a dock in Shanghai, uh, where a college graduate, Zhu, is com contemplating suicide when his friend Zhao, played by the notable Zhao Dan, leads him back to their apartment. Uh, we learn that his friends are un unemployed in Shanghai as a result of the financial fiasco of the Black Monday that severely depleted the city's economic growth or strength. Meanwhile, a female graduate, Yang, played by Bai Yang, moves next to Zhao. Zhao finds a job in the Mingguo Ribao of the Kuomintang. A lighthearted feud breaks out between the two neighbors. However, what has become a light romance between Zhao and Yang suddenly ends when Yang announces to Zhao one day that she's leaving Shanghai as a factory that she's been working in had closed down. Zhao tries to convince Yang to stay, but she decides to leave anyway. Yang's friend, who recognizes the romance, convinces Yang to stay in Shanghai. Zhao finds that he himself is out of work. He meets Yang and the two read in the newspaper that Zhao's friend Zhu had indeed committed suicide. Promising not to be weak, like Zhu, they march off into the sunset, optimistic of a hopeful future. I had a good laugh. I think we actually might be ready for this war. Yeah, maybe. Do we have enough weaponry? Perhaps. Anything here? Not too much that I care about. Uh, you two, go here. I'm going to go and convert you guys to Queenie's own. That's where we're going to need a lot of artillery. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of artillery. Nice. Standardized Army Organization, the National Revolutionary Army, by order of the National Disbandment Coalition, is hereby authorized to adopt two forms of division types of the standardized military organization. With the conclusion of both the guerrilla phase of the revolution and the Second Northern Expedition, the NRA is now to transition from the People's Army to one that's capable of bringing the National Revolution to Asia. Look at that. Fantastic. Just in time for way more artillery. Because I also want to throw on... Engineers. And actually, we're going to use these guys for now. Unification of China, huh? And now they're going to war with us. So let them get all their guys on the line? Yeah. That's quite a few divisions they have. Hopefully they don't naval invade us. That would be really bad. Just going to stop doing that for now. Even though the guy's not very good. So better than nothing. Oh, our guys are attacking. Can you help attack, then? Maybe? Maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe.
Just maybe. Let's get here. Sure, why not? Um. There you go. Better trucks, nice. Better guns. Slowly trying to catch up here, man. Hey, we're actually pushing in them a little bit. Look at that. Oh, would you look at this too? Uh, there you go. The revolutionary the monarchists, with Wang Jingwei's continued influence and within the National Revolutionary Government, many of his extended family found themselves in positions of power as the revolutionary the revolution continues forward. This sense he's drawn varying degrees of concern, scoring an invitation from party members as a so-called resistance faction takes shape. But not all of his kinsmen will be joining him in the presidential palace. Wang Xiaoyang has recently passed away in Macau in age of 76 or 78. The other half-brother Wang Jingwei is an accomplished poet, scholar, and Taoist, taking inspiration from his various travels around the country before his Jinhai Revolution. When the revolution when the revolution broke out, he visited Lo Fo Mountain and lived for a period of time in Suomo, Sumao Temple before going into seclusion in Macau. Despite attempts by both Wang and former uh, other Kuomintang members to recruit him, he has repeatedly refused their invitations, claiming his loyalty lies with the Qing monarchy. He, <coughs> he claimed to harbor continuing respect for the Emperor Puyi, even as his children got sought or sought work in the uncle's government. Throughout the early warlord era, he and other scholars claimed to be le the legacy of the old empire, writing nostalgic and traditional works. He was rewarded with recognition by the restored emperor with something he cherished by remaining his home, renaming his home Blessing Hall. The elder Wang is elected to remain in Macau even as the Kuomintang sweep across the nation, tending to their own works and refraining from making any major comments on politics. This funeral is expected to attract considerable visitors, given this status. He was an accomplished elder scholar on his own right, although it's not clear whether or not his relatives will be in attendance. Another family torn apart by war and charged the military regions. The struggle to unify this country both militarily and politically results chiefly due to the sheer vast expanse of the Chinese nation. Under the Military Affairs Commission, the National Revolutionary Army is to divide its forces into regions of operations uh, into 12 distinct military regions with overlap between provinces to aid the military organization. But I think we'll end it there. I've played on long enough, and uh, I think it'll be interesting to see because we're actually doing re relatively decently against these guys so far. Better than, than I thought we would. So, if you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as we continue to try to reform. China into one whole frickin' China. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.